Welcome to the Center for Universal Oneness. We are an open, welcoming, spiritual community that supports all faith traditions and invites you to join us on your spiritual journey. We host different speakers each week to guide and inspire us. We are guided by universal principles of acceptance of all that is sacred, and we strive to live in the oneness of love. Please enjoy this presentation. All right, so uh, our friend who is no stranger to this community, we wanna welcome back Mr. Paul Hesselback. Yay, let's give him a round of applause, yay. <laughs> Um, the talk uh, for uh, Paul's talk today will be titled The Keys to Self-Compassion. Um, Keys to Self-Compassion. That will be definitely interesting to hear. So uh, as you can see, our speaker bio uh, is one of Unity's leading metaphysic authorities and has a major role in bringing Unity metaphysics into the 21st century. Of course, you can see Paul has a website, paulhasselbeck.com, and he has a podcast, found at the metaphysicalromp2.com or any popular podcast. And he's written or co-written at least nine books. His most recent book is Use the Truth You Know, uh, Unity's Principles and Premises. So uh, we definitely want to welcome you today, Paul. Thank you for being here. And uh, without any further ado, we'll let you get started. Welcome. Take it away. Thank you for inviting me. I'm always delighted when I get a email from Barb wondering if I can speak. And so here I am, and I'm going to share with you uh, a few things today. And so I always invite you to sit back and relax. You might want to get your cell phone out and maybe take pictures of my slides. You can always email me for slides. And that's at alberthasselbeck at gmail.com. And you've already seen my website email address, I mean, website address, as well as the address for my podcast. So today's talk is about the keys to self-compassion. And this talk is based on a couple books, Your Resonant Self by Sarah Payton and The Self-Compassion by Christian Neff, PhD. I, reckon, I recommend these two books highly and I tend to listen to them. And these two books are really important to listen to because Sarah, does some guided meditations. And in Kristen Neff, you, you, can, you can get to hear what your resonant self sounds like, that, that kinder, more loving self. And so it was early in the, in the COVID thing that I was walking on the uh, Indian Park Trail when I was still living out in the World Park. And I was listening to that Your Resonant Self by Sarah Payton. And I got to a point where she started demonstrating what your kinder voice might sound like. And friends, it stopped me in my tracks. I mean, literally, I stopped walking because the truth is I really hadn't developed a compassionate inner voice. What I had developed over the years is the inner critic. And that inner critic says things, bad idea, bub. That was not smart. That was stupid. You're careless. And what else, you know? And, and I was able to identify whose voice I had internalized. It was the voice of my mother. And so that also prompted a a little exercise in, in, in forgiveness around my mother. But when, when that voice is activated, which, is, which used to be frequently, it was the voice for mom is what I called it. Okay, so there's a few more. Even my inner critic has inner critics. So in Unity, we talk about affirmations, but we don't really talk about defamations. Defamation is a negative affirmation. When we are in that inner critique mode, we are defaming ourselves as our humanity and as our divinity. So it's important we learn ways to be kinder with ourselves. And so I just read this in uh, Anthony Newberg, the words we use 
even ordinary words are strong enough to drum roll, change our brains and affect the expression of genes that regulate stress levels. That is an astounding piece of information. And I recommend almost any book from Anthony Newberg. And so the thing is, in a way, at least the culture I was raised in, self-criticism is part of it. And here's what Charles Fillmore had to say. Now I updated this. In our mere human judgment, we are hard and heartless. We deal out punishment without consideration of motive or cause and justice goes awry. And then Kristen says, strong individuals should be stoic and silent toward their own saying. Now that's based on her study and her studies are really huge. She probably is the number one authority on self-compassion probably in the world. But she found that in our cultures, strong individuals should be stoic and silent toward their own suffering. And I can remember my mother saying, when I hurt myself and fell down, I was crying, she would say, Paul, you're a Hasselbeck. You're supposed to be strong and not cry. And so that's another saying that's in my mind. So another thing she discovered is self-kindness is not a culturally valued response. I found that astounding. So when that inner voice is going, sometimes I'm just like, I need a hug. Do you ever feel that way? And so go ahead right now, give yourself a hug right now. Yep, yep. The thing is your brain doesn't know if someone else is hugging you or you're hugging you in a way. What you're doing is transmitting signals that will release oxycodone. Woohoo! And give us a little high. So there are three compo components to self-compassion. And so I've been practicing this, practicing this for about two years now. I've been retraining myself away from the inner critic to this higher, kinder voice. So the three components are be kind to ourselves, recognition of our common humanity, and mindfulness. So let's look at these a little more deeply. Being kind to ourselves, be gentle and understanding of ourselves rather than harshly critical and judgmental. So as soon as I'm aware that I'm in self-critical mode, I take a deep breath a few times to ground myself better, to center myself better. I remember that the principles of generosity and benevolence are 100% present at the point of me. And so then I start some inner dialogue and it's, it sounds something like this. Even so, I offer myself kindness and grace. In spite of this, I love myself just as I am. Even so, I love and honor myself. In spite of this, I love and accept myself. Now, some of these phrases come from my work with tapping, emotional freedom technique, because in tapping, you'll tap something on using this point, and, and then the, the end of the phrase is, even so, I love, honor, and accept myself. The second thing is recognition of our common humanity. I didn't realize how big this is. So, when we recognize our common humanity, we start to feel connected with others in the experience of life rather than feeling isolated and alienated by our suffering. Now, let me stop there for a moment because I have to say I had an allergy for the longest time about the word suffering. Whenever anybody brought up Buddhism and suffering, However, I think it's now in my mind important that we recognize suffering, not as a way to wallow in it, but in a way to be with it and live through it. And so this idea that we're all human is fundamental. 
Inadequacy and disappointment are shared by most people. We all make mistakes. We all make errors. Nobody is perfect. While the feelings are similar, the triggers or activators or circumstance and the degree of pain is different. So the feelings are similar, but the details may be different, but that it's that feelings where we are connecting. So the human experience is imperfect. I've already said that. And think about this. How do you speak to a child or a friend when they are imperfect? I think that's a good measure. And I could say before I started to wake up to this self-compassion thing, I was kinder and more compassionate with others than I was myself. You know that saying, we're our own worst critic is pretty, pretty true, okay? And, and just in case, a clear conscience might be a sign of a faulty memory. <laughs> if, we have, if we have a clear conscience and we're not thinking about some things we could have done better and all that, but it might be your memory. Even so, we want to practice self-compassion when that stuff comes up. So let's look at some supportive self-talk. It's human to error. Everyone makes mistakes. Life gets bumpy, things go wrong. I can succeed without being perfect. N not every flaw or weakness needs to be solved now. Isn't that amazing when you think about those things? And, and when I think about my work with attitudinal healing as well as I work in unity, is that I do find that when we're in a group and we're talking, in a way, we seem to bond more around the unwanted stuff of life than the good things that are going on. And we have to flip this. And and sure, we can acknowledge where we're suffering. Sure, we can acknowledge when we're having errors. But the deal is not to become self-critical because self-loathing and self-pity are separating. While the need to belong is fundamental to both physical and emotional health. Well, you may be sitting there thinking, well, Paul, you said we bond around this stuff. Well, we do but we really don't bond around self-loathing and self-pity. That's the reaction. Self-loathing and self-pity is the reaction to whatever we're suffering about. And so what we do, we, we separate ourselves from others thinking somehow we are different and somehow we are flawed. And then the next component is mindfulness. We hold our experience in balanced awareness rather than ignoring our pain or exaggerating it. And we can say rather than ignoring our suffering or exaggerating it. So what's mindfulness? The quality or state of being aware or inclined to be aware it's also a non-judgmental state of heightened or complete awareness of one's thoughts, emotions, or experience on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. Now, this mindfulness isn't the, the, the meditation practice. I'm going to say something about that in, the, in a minute. This is being mindfully aware as you go about your life, what's going on on in the exterior, as well as what's, what's going on in the interior. What are you feeling? What, what are you saying to yourself as you move through life? However, mindfulness meditation is an important component because in mindfulness meditation, we practice being in the present moment. It trains us to become more mindful, thoughtful throughout the day particularly during difficult situations. So mindfulness here is your awareness of what's going on in the present moment without judgment. Mindfulness refers to the clear seeing and non-judgmental acceptance of what's occurring in the present moment. Okay, so, so why am I emphasizing the present moment? It, it's because when I'm suffering, mostly it's suffering about something I did in the past 
or the suffering might be in the form of, of worry. And so I'm, I'm using my power of imagination to imagine what might happen in the future. And so when I'm, when I'm thinking about the past and when I'm thinking about the future, it seems like I'm in the past. It seems like I'm in the future. Now that's a metaphysical impossibility. However, that's the, per that's the perception we, we create. And so when, when I notice I'm wrapped up in a judgment or, or focus on the past or futurizing in negative ways, I use this technique. Maybe you've used it too. It's called the five, four, three, two, one grounding technique. This technique is focusing on what our physical body is sensing in the moment. And that puts us in the present. So just do this along with me, okay? So first we, we realize where we are, notice five things you can see. And notice four things you can touch. Notice three things you can hear. Notice two things you can smell. And then notice one thing you can taste. And take a deep breath and just notice if you feel more in the present moment right here and now. I find this exercise disconnects me from being in the past re with regrets and suffering or, or futurizing. It, it grounds me right into the present moment. And this is essentially a noting technique. Helps us become more consciously aware of what we're experiencing in the present. It can be used in any situation. Every time you become aware of a new experience, make a note of it. And if you notice you're futurizing or in the past in your, in your mental thinking, then allow your awareness to settle on the next thing. So the importance of mindfulness is we don't have to believe every thought or emotion is real or true. We're not denying the experience but every thought or emotion is not necessarily true. It provides an opportunity to respond rather than react. Why? Because that moment of awareness creates a pause where we can more consciously choose whether we're gonna react or respond. When we can recognize our feelings in the present moment, we don't have to let those feelings propel us into action. You see, when we think those feelings are in, in the past, when we think those thoughts are in, in the past, we really can't do much about them. But when we know those thoughts and feelings, when we know the suffering is in the present moment, we can do something in the present moment to change it. And one of the most important ways is this self-compassion thing. Be kind and gentle to yourself. In those moments, you want to beat yourself up. So we're able to re -over overcome from reactions more carefully. And then here's a little more to consider. While we have thoughts and feelings and emotions, we realize we are not those thoughts and feelings and emotions. And so self-compassion's three core components are kindness, common humanity and mindfulness. And remember, we can draw on kindness at any moment because those two principles of benevolence and generosity are always present, 100% present at the point of view. All it requires is you and I decreeing it or putting a demand on it in the present moment. And yeah, we're all human. OK, not sometimes we're easier at cutting other slack than ourselves. It's time 
we cut our uh, cut ourselves slack. And of course, all of this requires that be, we be mindful in the present moment. So as you go about the rest of this day and or week, remember these three things. Be kind to yourself, acknowledge your humanity, and be present in the moment through mindfulness. And that, my friends, are the keys to self-compassion that I have found life-changing in some ways in the last two years. Thank you for listening as we prepare to have a meditation. And so as a way to do that, let's begin with the five, three, two, one exercise again. First, give yourself a good old hug. Yeah, uh-huh. Appreciate yourself. And then think of five things you can see. Four things you can touch. Three things you can hear. Two things that you can smell. And one thing you can taste. And whenever I get to that step of two things I can smell, one of them is always freshly baked chocolate chip cookies. And so we continue to breathe gently in and out, being mindful, being centered right here, right now. Knowing that you and I are 100% divine, and 100% human. It's in our divinity we are truly one. In our divinity we are identical. Because the divine is present in its entirety at every point in space, all at the same time. And we are 100% human. And in our humanity, we do make mistakes. There are errors. And in those moments, we offer ourselves a huge helping of kindness and grace. Just as we would to a child who makes a mistake or to a friend or relative that makes a mistake. So right now, Maybe there's something that you considered a mistake you did in the last week or so. And in some way, you've been creating some internal suffering around that. See yourself being kind to yourself. See yourself speaking words of love and comfort. Feel that right here, right now. That kindness and grace bubbling up from deep within, using benevolence and generosity, and of course, love. And as a closing affirmation, let us say, you can repeat this after me. I love myself just the way I am. I love myself just the way I am. And so it is. Amen. <laughs>